flyover leader fan. Fan rated network. The stories a stadium could tell. Hell yeah. And KFAN.com. One minute, 57 seconds past 3 o'clock. That's Central Daylight Time. Welcome back. It is a Monday production of the Bumper to Bumper Show on another in an endless series of outstanding late September afternoons here in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. I am the host of the program. My name is Dan Barrero. Garzi is the producer. He is indeed back. And we are delighted that you are along for what should be a, not a, a pretty smooth ride. I don't think it's going to be all that bumpy today. Lots and lots to discuss and lots of good people to uh, talk to, including Nacho Lieber, usual time about 447. Uh, we've got talking points brought to you by our good friends at uh, Federated Insurance. And we expect just in the next five or ten minutes the usual uh, early phone call from Viking Safety Cam Bynum who had another takeaway yesterday, a fumble recovery, and then a new celebration, which we will get to with him as well, as the Vikings advance or improve to a perfect 4-0 and record. And um, we like to think of ourselves here as flyover country, but at least this week, maybe for many, many weeks, there is no M, there is no Minnesota in flyover. The Vikings, in short order, it's taken them one month, basically, four games. The month of September, this is, there goes my chair. Oh, it's I've, that chair, huh? It's the chair that just kind of keeps moving yep. you down. Yep. Like it's like it's cutting you down to size or it's something. It's a sinkhole it's, chair. It's very humbling. It, it is, trust me. In one month, the Minnesota Vikings have become the talk of the National Football League. And I'm not exaggerating. Right now, they are the top subject in the National Football League. Now, if we go into a slump, we'll return to flyover land. But all systems are go right now after the uh, road victory at Lambeau that got extremely nerve-wracking late. Vikings ultimately hold on. What was the final? 31-29? We won by two, yes. 31-29. to That's what made that what made the onside nerve-wracking was Green Bay didn't need a touchdown to tie or to win. All they needed was a field goal, again, not to tie, but to win. And uh, all's well that ends well in that regard. I have not seen, did you notice the, how often does a team do a drop kick, onside kick? I hadn't, I, off the top of my head, I don't remember one. A fascinating effort. Um, based on what looked to be a kind of a tense conversation between the Packers, uh, uh, special teams coordinator and the head coach, I got the feeling that maybe he wasn't that enamored with the, um, that decision because ball didn't really have much spin on it. It, it was a pretty routine recovery. Who recovered it for us? Do you remember? I don't even remember. But I know it was pretty smooth. It was, it was clean. There was ne it was never even in doubt, just like the Gopher game. Never even in doubt who was going to indeed recover it. Josh Oliver scooped Josh it Oliver, our guy Josh Oliver. He scored a touchdown. Yes, he did. Guy who everybody said was brought here to block. All he does is catch passes and touchdowns. We played the long game with that theory. Apparently we did. We're also hardly in flyover country anymore involving your favorite professional basketball team. Ain't nothing flyover about the Minnesota Timberwolves. They, too, like the Vikings, are the talk of their league, not locally, not regionally, but nationally. Involved in a stunner of a deal, especially coming really on the eve or close to the eve of training camp opening. Those kinds of deals just don't happen, but they did. Garzi's guy, Cat, is gone, and the new era of Minnesota Timberwolves basketball, for better or for worse, is upon us. Um, Julius Randle is coming to town with Dante DiVincenzo, the two big pieces that the Wolves got in return. The first round pick is not as fancy and exciting and arousing as it appeared when yep. we first year. Oh, it's a Detroit number one? Yep. Basically, it's going to end up probably being a couple of twos. Exactly. By the time, because it's so protected. It's protected for like the next 18 years. For and then I think in year 19, yeah. we would get um, a, maybe two, two second round picks. It's there's no hope 
at least for me, no. that Detroit will ever be good enough for that, that pick exactly to not right. be protected. That's exactly right. The more I read into it. But how rarefied is this air that we're in from a sports market standpoint to be the talk of the National Football League, to be the talk of the National Basketball Association? And here's the kicker. This is, I think, the most underrated ask. We can we can debate the trade itself, and I will listen to all points of view on the trade. I don't think it's a slam dunk either way. I don't. But the hidden sneaky part that should not be diminished or dismissed by your average Minnesota sports fan, or you're certainly your Minnesota Timberwolves fan, is... The notion that part of the reason the Wolves did this is they're going to have more flexibility. If, for example, if, for example, a certain all-time shooting great Kevin Durant gets a little bit disinterested in Phoenix, if Phoenix is a mess again, that he might not mind coming here. How often in our history have we been that connected potentially, just potentially, to a player of that caliber? There's nothing flyover about the Minnesota Timberwolves organization at this point. We indeed have Cam Bynum. He is our Monday regular. And um, he probably feels pretty good about these segments because so far uh, he's undefeated since coming on with us. The Vikings improved to 4-0. Cam joins us via the Connecticut Water Systems hotline. Uh, congratulations on another victory. For the fans, as you know, it went from... What a steamroller to, oh, my God, this is getting a little bit nerve-wracking. How nerve-wracking did it get for you as a member of the defense on the field? Uh, it wasn't too nerve-wracking. It was just one of those games where we know we knew, if, okay, first half we were dominant. Second half, uh, we uh, really, we didn't just do our job as well as we did in the first half. The execution wasn't there, and... Um, so just the way that we let them come back, especially we take ownership on defense of giving up that many points that late in the game. Um, we we knew we always had the confidence that we're going in there to go make plays, yeah. and we made plays. But the way that we gave up a lot of chunk plays and uh, really gave certain things up made us really have to look at ourselves like, what's going on here, and what are we doing, and how can we stop this? So, but at no point was it nerve wracking fearing of losing the game. We knew we would come out with it. Uh, we just knew that we had to get, get like like Murph did. He had two sure. turnovers yep. late in the fourth, and um, that and that changed the game. So we knew the, the game was in our hands, and we didn't do very well with that at the end, but at the end of the day, we did enough to win. Uh, you mentioned Murph uh, leading to the fumble, re- your fumble recovery. Um, the art of punching the ball out always fascinates me because it's obviously not easy if it were You'd have, you know, nine fumbles a game. But there are players, I remember, you know, back in the day, uh, uh, Charles Peanut Tillman of, of the Bears, the team I grew up watching, he seemed to master that art beautifully of knocking the ball out. That certainly looked like a textbook case of knocking the ball away. What did you see on that play? And you got right, you you were there, but you got, it looked to me like you got right on it. Yeah, I had a front row seat of it. Um, but like you said, it's it's just an art to it. Uh, finding the correct angle to get the ball out, seeing the space um, in the with the ball carrier hold, holding the ball, and that's something teams and we, we study every single week. Okay, what ball carriers are loose with the football? Um, and what positions are they mo- most vulnerable to fumble the ball? Whether they're it's when they're in traffic or trying to break tackles, is the ball coming loose? So that's things we study during the week, just so we can know our opportunities. And Murph did a great job knowing that the the runner was fighting for extra yards at that point. So yeah. um, him uh, either, whether he's trying to stiff arm somebody or even trying to cover the ball up at the last second, it's not enough if somebody gets a good punch on the ball. So um, that's something we practice and we wrap every single day of practice. Um, so just to see it come to life and you get those the small amount of opportunities to get a clean punch um, like Murph did. So just the way that the, it executed in the game and for something that we practice every day was really satisfying to watch, especially having a front row seat. Absolutely. So is there an art to recovering a fumble as well? Because we see it all the time where it's a clear, there's a clear opportunity for a, for a defender 
and somehow they land on it and it kind of bounces away from them or somebody else gets in there. Uh, so is there an art to make sure in your eagerness <laughs> that you hold on to the ball and protect it? Yeah, I'd say the biggest art of that is knowing, okay, is it, we, we, we have two words. We say city and country. If it's a city, that means it's really crowded. There's a lot of people around. Yeah. So that's one where you just jump on it. Okay. If it's country, that means it's a lot more space and now you can go scoop and score. And that's the two different mindsets that you have to have and be clean on because you see a lot of in the, around the league, a lot of times there's a fumble and there's a lot of people around. Somebody tries to scoop it and they have, end up kicking the ball and <laughs> losing their opportunity to take the ball away. So just knowing whether you should jump on top of it and grab it or if you can just run by and scoop it up to go fight for extra yards. But knowing that is 95% of the battle. Then the other other part is just judging the bounce if the ball's on the move or just knowing, okay, do I can I scoop it up and go or do I just jump on top? Were you tempted to try to scoop? Nah, I, I, I felt way too many people around me. And my, close, oh. my closest teammate was um, – Blake Cashman and I couldn't tell. I just I just felt somebody running near me, so I didn't know if it was a, a Packers sure. player. So I was like, let me let me just jump on it, get the offense the ball, especially the way the offense was rolling. I was completely content with with um, just getting the turnover at that point after he forced a fumble. Yeah, and it was yeah he I think he was like right behind you and then kind of landed on top of you to help protect, make sure no. And because I don't even think a Packer ended up being close in on the play at all, right? You you did have yeah no they didn't. That's right. Yeah, thought. they didn't touch us at all. So yeah. um, there's really nobody. So that's why everybody is making fun of me after. They're like, bro, you could have picked <laughs> yeah, it up and right. tried to reverse field. But I'm like, chill. We got to just get the offensive yep. ball. I don't want to do too much and end up kicking the ball out of bounds, especially with it being next to the sideline. Yeah, that was such a key possession. Like you said, they're they're trying to. They have they're they're getting back in it. And the most important thing for you at that point is to make sure you got the ball. You mentioned the chunk plays late, so. How is uh, B flow with you guys on that? Did he has he already? Did he deliver a message last night? Does he already deliver a message today? What's to learn from? Because you know he always talks about look, every defense has a weakness or weaknesses, and my job mm-hmm. is actually to try to cover those up as much as possible. Um, what what kind of message did he did he deliver? Uh, really, just the fact that we got away with we got away uh, really treating this as. A learning lesson because we got away with getting the win and not playing well in the second half and not finishing the game. And we did enough in the first half and the first part of the game, first three quarters really to put ourselves in position to have a convincing win. But the way we really gave, not gave up, but gave up um, too many points higher than our standard um, in the end of the game, his message was just use this as a learning experience and we're thankful that we got the win, but don't look at this as something that we can really hold as our standard because we know it was below the standard with execution, with effort was there, effort was good and everything, yeah. but late in the game when they're moving fast and the the offense is going fast, it was really like a two-minute drive for the whole fourth quarter. So uh, we just knew that as we got more tired, yeah. the execution started to slip a little more. So that's really the biggest biggest piece of advice that he gave us in coaching and he really coached it hard and I'm glad that he coached us hard and the whole staff coached the whole whole game hard um in the film room just knowing that okay it's cool that we got the win but we had a lot of my bads here and there which added up to a lot of points you know the it's interesting because people talk all the time about and and KOC has talked about this on his side when he's running the offense going hurry up getting the line of scrimmage a little quicker Eliminating the possibility that the other team can can you know make some some changes in their lineup and make the defense you know never really get a chance to get a break. So I assume for you guys, same thing. I mean that can be a bit challenging, correct? Yeah, it's just uh, really in every phase we all have to complement each other. Um, if offense is going three now, or if the defense is um, if we're not doing our job, special teams. If one person, one phase of the game doesn't do their job, it makes it harder on the other people. And that's where we say we have to play with complementary football and help everybody help each other to have the best game that they can have. So um, it was for sure times in the game where um, it'd be a quick turnaround or even for us, offense would have a long drive, go score. We'd get a quick turnover, and they have to go back on the field. And obviously that's a happy time for 
the team, but I know that's a, a tough time physically, them sure. being back on the field. So uh, we really just all make sure that we can be the best teammates possible by playing as well as possible. Well, Love, you know, we, we talked about him last week in previewing this game, that it was likely he was going mm-hmm. to play, and it looked to me like, you know, he looked a little rusty early. It looked like he wasn't really moving all that well early, but as he got into it, he warmed up a little bit. You guys did a great job, you know, taking the ball away from him, which is a key. Took away, I think, from their standpoint of all the yardage they got. He can sling it, though, right? I mean, we saw that again. There are some times where if, if he's given time to do it, he can he can do some damage. Yeah, he has a record-breaking contract for a reason. <laughs> so um, that was never a question of whether his knee was okay or not. We, we knew he's a great quarterback, and he's one of the tops in the league. And... Um, you, you go back and watch the film. He's making really good throws. There's time where the pressure would affect the throw and making him throw off of his back foot. So there's a lot of underthrown balls and a few tip balls that we had and a few other tip balls that could have gone our way. But there's never a time in the week where we thought, regardless of his status with his knee, we all knew he's a great quarterback and have good weapons on the whole offense too. So we knew it would be a challenge. And um, obviously, first half, in second half were two different stories, but um, really respect to them for being able to pick it up in the second half of the game when their backs were against the wall, and they they showed why they they made it far in the playoffs last year also. So, you know, there was a lot made during the game and even beforehand of Aaron Jones returning to Green Bay where he'd spent so much time and had so much success, and he had some good success again yesterday. He didn't get to, I guess he didn't do the leap till after the game, but nevertheless, he got the he got the victory. When when there's a teammate, and where the, where there's that kind of angle to the story that that player is going back to a place where you know he knows it well and has invested a lot, and the fans are invested in him. Does it matter to you guys? Is that something you guys warm to the situation of okay, what 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 can he do to make this a special occasion individually for him as well? How aware were you of of the history and how much do you think it meant to him? For the team, as you say, to come out with the victory, and for him to have some very good, very good production as well. Um, I would say just throughout the week, he did a good job of just keeping it business and not making it bigger than what it was. Because at the end of the day, it's just another game and another division game that we have to go out there and play well and win. So his preparation, mindset, and everything looked exactly the same as it always does. Um, he practiced just as hard as he always does. So there's really never a a time where we see him doing too much because he's going back to Green Bay. But just knowing him and knowing the history that he had there, I think, what, seven years yep. he did there and a really good career there. And that obviously changed his life um, and his family's life, the things that he was able to do in Green Bay. So that's a big deal. So we, we knew the magnitude of that. So as teammates, we all wanted to go out there and make sure that he leaves there with the win. Kind of similar to when we played Houston, sure. having having yeah. JG on the defense, having Cash, um, and all the players that used to play with them. Our mindset was: we have to let you guys. We need bragging rights for you guys. <laughs> you guys, you can't go out there against your old team and lose. And just as teammates, that's our our motivation to do it for your teammate and make sure that they can be on the winning end of their their reuniting with their old teams. Cam Bynum is our guest, Vikings safety. You play defense, obviously. But when you do, I assume that the challenge can get tougher when you face an offense that can offer both a threat running the ball and throwing the ball. And that brings me right back to Aaron because this team is, uh, your, your offense is so much more balanced this point where defenses have to respect the run, right? We've seen it. They're averaging by mm-hmm. five yards a carry. And I I would assume you could testify as a defensive player that that makes it harder for you guys to guess successfully or, you know, that it's tougher to sell out one way or the other if the other team's offense can both throw the ball and run it, correct? Yeah, for sure. When you have a team that can uh, really do both or play against a team that, that can do, both run the ball and pass the ball, it makes makes life on defense is tougher because now the playbook is way more open. Now you know those third and two situations aren't always a pass down. They can easily just hand the ball off and get yards, and that'll be an easy first down. So really having a run game opens up the the playbook a lot more, and being able to 
um, be in the, on a team right now with us with our offense running the ball like they are and passing the ball, it's fun to watch. And, um, and when we're going against other teams that have the same type of attack, it's always a, a tougher game knowing that they can do both. 4-0, of course, is, is the record. And, and now you head across the pond to London. How much experience do you have with uh, games in Europe, and and does it does it do anything to change your preparation in terms of the rhythm of it? Obviously, quite different than if you're just playing a game, you know, in the United States. Uh, this is, will be my second time there. Um, first time was kind of a surprise to me because really it was a lot less than it was a lot smaller than I expected. As far as being in London, I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be a lot, a lot of things different. We're probably not going to practice as much, but really the, the process and the the schedule is exactly the same. We get there, we get off the plane, and we um, get a meal in, and we go straight to practice. And we're practicing on a field, and we have meetings. They set up meeting rooms in the hotel. So really the whole process of it is really exactly the same. I, originally I was thinking that it might be different. We're overseas, so we're going to be – uh, it's going to be tougher to do certain things like having meeting rooms and full on everything like we have at the facility. But no, they have a weight room ready for us. They have um, massage therapists. So really, your your whole process doesn't really change much besides being in a different location that you're not used to. Food may be different than what you're used to, but there's they make sure to take care of us on those trips to make sure that we have everything we possibly need to have a good good showing on Sunday. Were you working on uh, some skull chants with the Vikings fans at Lambeau yesterday? Oh, I worked on a little bit of everything trying to turn <laughs> up the fans because we needed the momentum, especially in the second half when um, when things weren't going our way, trying to get the get the chance going a little to start our energy back up. But that's one thing I love doing, interacting with fans and being able to make the game more enjoyable for people. So whether it's celebrations or whether it's um, just screaming to the fans, like, let's go, let's go, and trying to do skull chants. Even in away games, we feed off that energy. So that just goes to show how important fans are to us players. So you went with this celebration, you went gymnastics on the bit. I think I saw somewhere where, again, you had practiced this. Is that, I mean, is this a new one just established for this week? Was this something you had choreographed previously that you were saving for this moment? Tell us about the history of the uh the gym, the gymnastics flip. Yeah, the gymnastics flips. I've been I've been doing. I wouldn't say I've never done like organized gymnastics, but I've done been doing gymnastics and flips and everything since I was a kid. Just trying to figure out the best backflip I can do, or having a trampoline in my backyard as a kid. We always try to do whatever crazy tricks we can do. So I'm like, let me let me bring that back <laughs> and make sure that I can I can do it. In pads, so I had to practice during the week, and I was like, okay, yeah, when I have some adrenaline, this will be easy. Uh, but I might have used it prematurely. I don't know if uh, a fumble recovery counts as a big big enough celebration <laughs> to get a backflip, so I might have to reuse the backflip one when I get another pick. Were you getting some abuse from teammates on that? They think you went too hard? No, nobody saw it. That, that was the funny oh, part. Oh, I like, see. Okay. It, it, it's just funny because when when you get a forced fumble and a fumble recovery, Really, the person you want to celebrate with is the person that forced the Good point. Yeah. So, I gotcha. uh, and that's always the thing because that's the hard. I did the easy part, picking <laughs> it up. Murph did all the work. So yeah. I'm like, he should be down here celebrating with yeah. me. But I saw the opportunity, and as a, you know, the energy was up for, for the uh, division game. So, and it's the Packers. So I'm like, yeah, let me do it. Let me hit it back with. I quick. thought you stuck the landing pretty good. How'd you feel about the landing? Oh, I thought it was perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I maybe could have straightened my body out a little more to make it more of a layout <laughs> right. instead of a, a backflip or a back tuck. But I'll, I'll keep working on my technique, and I'll add to it, do a few more flips next time. It's a good look, I think. Uh, last item, it's uh, Aaron Rodgers, who the, the, the Jets did not, next week, did not have a very good uh, week offensively. But you know this guy's history. You know how historic a player he is. He's seen pretty much... Everything. What kind of challenge does uh, does he represent? Um, just going against him, you always know you're going to get the best. Um, you know you have to play everybody um, tight because it's pretty much every ball will be on the money. And going against a quarterback like him is it's fun because you know that um, it's just a, it's really a mono a mono game. It's just you against them, 
as far as your coverage and as far as being on point because, you know, you make one mistake. He's so experienced where he'll find find any open any open spot that you leave in your zone or any mistake, and he'll exploit that. So going into games like this against Aaron Rodgers, having played against him for, what, the past few years when he was in Green Bay, my first two years, so I've played against him a few times, and it was always a challenge, but a fun challenge. So I'm looking forward to it this week. Safe travels uh, to London, and we will chat next week. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. That's Cam Bynum, Vikings safety. Very selflessly acknowledging, hey, I fell on the ball. <laughs> the play was made by a teammate, which is true, but you got to recover it. And uh, that's part of the deal as well. Uh, let's pause. This will help us set up the rest of a very busy program. we got a lot of good Vikings talking points to get to today that Garzi has put together. we got Ben Lieber to get to. We've got uh, some leftover Minnesota Twins to discuss. we got a lot on the uh, trade, the blockbuster deal that the Wolves made. Not officially yet, but obviously it's a matter of time. Reported first Friday night by our guy Johnny and others. Uh, so let's pause here and prepare for the rest of what should be a very good show. Let's get to our uh, first Vikings talking point that uh, I think will sort of set up the rest of today's broadcast. The counterpunch delivered once again by a not-all-that-shy KOC and the Vikings offense after the Green Bay Packers, in dramatic come-from-behind fashion, have cut the lead after a two-point conversion to six. Sam Darnold under center, first and ten from his own 30-yard line. Aaron Jones, the tailback. Addison with two touchdowns out wide right. Play action. Jones picks up the blitz. Pass right. Caught! Justin Jefferson on Keyshawn Nixon at the 47-yard line. Gain of 17 for 18. And now all these cheeseheads can go ahead and sit down. Darnold play action again. Screen right. It's a Josh Oliver screen. Makes a move at the 50 to the left. And he gets to the Packers 45 for a screen gain of 8. By Josh Oliver, second and two. So for Jeff Halfley, the defensive coordinator for the Packers, where do you where do you where do you think the Josh Oliver screen ranked <laughs> on his plays to stop? Right. <laughs> now we're showing a little bit of tempo here too. Yeah. You know, it's it's we got a foot on the gas pedal, Paul, and offensively, and I think you know it's it's your identity, it's what you got to do, but um, don't. Just try to keep it safe as possible. I got my fingers crossed. Sam Darnold in his Lambeau Field debut. First down facing another blitz. Fires right. Caught Jefferson on the run. 40, 35, 30. Angles left to the 25, 20. Justin Jefferson. Go ahead and be the best player on the field. Sam Darnold shotgun. Back to pass. Looking left. Throwing left. And Aaron Jones caught it at the 13 and runs out of bounds at the 10-yard line. An effortless pitch and catch of eight yards. So now it's second and two from the Green Bay 10. Yeah, we're just, and again, we're, you know, taking the opportunity that with the Packers putting as many guys in the box as they are, the vulnerability is the outside, and we've been attacking, right? And we've answered the blitzes. We've protected well. This is a 33-yard try between the hash marks to kick the Vikings to a nine-point lead. Snap spot. Riker, kick up, and it's yes. good. Yes. He's six of six. Woo. And the Minnesota Vikings lead 31-22 with 6.50 to go in the game. I was about to say there's your ball game. It's a little more complicated than that with what happened down the stretch. But I will continue to believe what I believe for many, many years if your comeback, true comeback, must include the miracle known as an onside kick recovery, then I don't really feel that sorry for you. Because that there's a million of the how, Over the years, how many, at every level, how many of those have we seen where, wow, they, oh, they cut it to one score, look out. But they were out of timeouts. They had no choice but to do an onside kick. Bottom line is, the series that you just heard largely was the ball game. Or you could make the argument that if the Vikings didn't do then what they did, then the Packers would have been in a much better position to actually complete a comeback under slightly different circumstances. And it's followed the same pattern 
as the Niners game here, where the lead, the Niners cut the lead. We were about to go up big. Jones fumbles inside the one. San Francisco marches 99 yards with the extra point to cut the lead to six. And what did the Vikings do? Well, they threw. And the uh, Sam Darnold, the starting quarterback, had three significant, I think all third down completions, conversions. At least two of them were on third down. Yes. There were definitely several nice throws. And here again, especially on the road, crowd is primed. For the first time, they are feeling it. We've just strip-sacked them. They, I'm talking about we saying Packer fans are thinking that. They go in, they get the touchdown, they get the two-point conversion, and they're going, this is it. This is the series. And there was nothing meek about what the Vikings did offensively to O'Connell's credit, starting with first that 17-yard completion to from the 30 to J.J. that you heard at the beginning of that process, and then two plays later, the 27-yard pass that already put the to to JJ that put the Vikings in a position to at least get ultimately had to settle for three, but got three, a two possession game once again. So that to me is the most positive aspect of both of these games. Is you you your defense was reeling a little bit, and you could even say. In Green Bay, your offense was reeling a little bit in the second half. They hadn't really done much of anything after a clinical first half. And you go, all right, here it is. I mean, it, the 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 entire vibe of this game has turned. In here, it was against San Francisco at home. They are even tougher for all the obvious reasons at, at Lambeau, where they think great things will happen for them and have happened for them off and off and uh, over and over again, even in close games. And at that point, Vikings said, not so fast, my friend. And in a game, again, where they really did have a good running game, and frankly, later in that drive, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more use yes. of the running game. Yes. We're going to get to that later. But I do think just because you throw as effectively as, as they did early in that possession, on a first down, on a second first down, and then on a second and two, that doesn't mean you can't mix in a running game that had been very effective for you as well. That's where I, again, get a little bit worried about the head coach. Moral of the story, though, is they move the ball. And like against San Francisco, they had to settle for three, but that was the three points that in both cases turned it back into a two-possession game and at least for the moment took the momentum back away and took the life out of a crowd. In fact, you could hear it, as P.A. noted, on the first down play. The first completion for 17 yards, right there, the starch was back out of the crowd, and I'm sure the it, it also helped the Vikings gain a little bit of confidence. That's something this team now has done in crucial situations offensively at a point where it looked like the game was about to turn. It's not the same scenario that Bill Belichick was talking about last week. We need to see if the Vikings can play from behind. No, but... It's not it's, that far off, it's not. especially how quickly that game turned and everybody that was still left, because some people actually did leave. Gerby won't admit it, I'm sure, but some people did leave. Are we going to try to get him on? I think we should. I think, I think it's have only to try right. At least, yeah. We'll pretend that we're calling Looking about for... a dating service or something. <laughs> and not, We're supposed to meet somebody at the American Family Gate yesterday, and it didn't work out. <laughs> but credit to O'Connell for putting it in the hands of Darnold. Credit to Darnold for making the plays. Also, give more credit to KOC for finding ways to get Justin Jefferson open at that time, right? Like, this is, mm -hmm. they don't have anybody that can guard him. Right. He'd been... Jay uh, Alexander, who talked all week, didn't play, wanted, didn't dress. Wanted nothing to do with it. Apparently, Apparently not. said he wouldn't feel comfortable out there guarding those guys. And the Vikings feasted on that, good on them. Yes, they did. But to be able to protect finally for the first time in the second half, to put the ball in Darnold's hand, and then find ways to get it to your best player, and I know we're going to play the other catch later because they did it in the fourth quarter there. Like That's that's how you close out a ball game. They did a poor job in other areas closing it out. I yes. know we're going to talk about those, but they did enough, and back-to-back, -back, or not back-to-back -back weeks, but twice now, they've been able to really stem the tide and take a game back that they had lost well, control of. We, you know, again, I think the Vikings ended up giving up almost 500 yards total offense, like 465, something. It's that, way too easy in the second half. That's too many, and that's way too easy. But, and I don't know how the, what the analytics people say about this, but when I'm, I'm when I'm doing my, my permutations and my calculations, 
even in a game in which I've given up almost 500 yards total offense, if I've got, how many takeaways do we have? Four? Yeah, three picks and a we fumble. Had four takeaways. Yeah. Those have to be factored in because in the first half, those led to scores as well. So, yeah, it's too many yards. You, 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 you heard Cam Bynum. It, it's fairly clear that the defensive coordinator, uh, Brian Flores, was on these guys after this game that they, 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 the defense lucked out with the way it played in the second half. But I also think you do have to put some kind of um, value even in a game where you go at that many yards, on taking the ball away as often as they did. Now, you could say uh, we, we've got a couple of the turnovers, uh, takeaways, uh, that we'll, we'll uh, get to later in more detail. One of the throws from Love was just airmailed, where that was on the Har- Hitman Harry yep, uh, the last pick. blitz. Yep. But, uh, you know, and so he just kind of threw that up, and you say, well, that's a pretty easy pick. It is, but it was to a certain extent forced by a really good blitz decision and by Smith going right to the right place to where Love's got Love admitted after the game he just should have thrown the ball away. Easier said than done. But that's what that's how good, you know, ball hawking defenses entice even capable quarterbacks of of making big mistakes. And that was obviously a very large blunder as well. Bradshaw and Brian Kaffee and text line is open. At six four six eight six, um, we should break here. Oh, that's right! I forgot because we went uh, we went long in the first segment. Let's do it. We'll break. We'll come back. More talking points. Lieber will join in the four o'clock hour as well. Plenty of time to get back to the fallout regarding the Timberwolves' big deal. Still not official, but definitely going to happen. Uh, we'll try to talk Garzy off the ledge on it. Although I had to kind of talk myself off the ledge on it as well. I think I'm there, and we'll get some reaction. From uh, the uh, the audience as well, Steve. I call this uh, Vikings talking point. Kick the damn field goal. This play call here is going to be Jeff very, very oh. interesting. It's fourth down, fourth and very short from the Green Bay four. Couple of receivers right, Sherfield senior left. Darnold hands it to Naylor on a jet sweep, turns up at the five, lunges ahead for what should be a first down, unless we get a terrible spot. Yeah, what's with the spots? I mean, Naylor turned that thing up hard and go for what should be a first down. That's the first run of Jalen's career, by the way. Boy, it'd be a big one if he got that first down. Yeah, how about that? Well, we can go ahead and get Kenny Clark uh, out from the middle of uh, Vinovich and his group, all right? I love Kenny Clark, too. But, man, <laughs> this ain't his he, I mean, he might. If he jumps, he takes, Lambeau Field shakes and the ball will move. Yeah, he takes up Ooh, a lot here of we space. Go, here we go, What do you got, Paul? Well, this is the whole game. Chains down, and he didn't get it. Packers ball. Oh, come on. A big deal. I mean, they got to go 97 yards with no timeouts, 214 to go in the game. Cool, they get the two-minute warning. We're happy for you. And then score again. All right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> they, if they can score quickly, onside kick. Or you're then, being too verklempt. I'm just, Paul, I'm just saying. <laughs> the preamble before the snap w- was even funnier. It could have gone like three and a half minutes, but I had to cut it had somewhere. To cut it, had to edit. Um, I originally also thought it was a bad spot, but as was explained on the TV, his knee, he, he kind of lunged after the knee went down. I think the spot was legit. Regardless, it it's not going to be the same talking point it would have been if somehow, some way, the Vikings would have actually lost that game. But that was be that's not the head coach is putting it on the basis of I just want to show yeah I, I I'm delivering a message to these guys how much I believe in them that's not coaching Kevin O'Connell you literally I mean if you think about the way this thing played out and again we had no way to know that they would drive the length of the field and get there in about five seconds really fast yes really fast but they did so that in this case again. They don't need another touchdown off an onside kick. They need a field goal to win it. That's that's how razor thin this thing was, and it's why 100 out of 100 times you kick that field goal, as far as I'm concerned, right? I mean, I, I just don't even think it's close, and I, 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 I am bothered by the head coach trying to disguise a bad decision or excuse a bad coaching decision 
because he wants the players to like him. You know, the players, he's the head coach is already established by the possession we just teed off on before the break that he believes in this offense and he believes in being aggressive and he doesn't believe in being passive. But in that spot, you've got to kick the field goal to go up 12, period. End of story. This isn't about being, you know, you know, that's why that's a that's a trying to avoid losing rather than trying to win. No. If you're trying to win the game, you go up 12 points, period. I'm stunned there's this much discussion about it. I agree. I felt it at the time as well. I tweeted about it yesterday. Nine is so much different than 12, especially if they do get the onside kick. Yes. And uh, Abbott reminded us that the drop kick that you're talking about, you're not allowed to use a T anymore in the onside kick as part of the rule. I'd forgotten about that. Right. Although I have seen it kicked off the ground, yes. too, as an onside. Yeah. So you've got to... Let's say you get the onside kick at the forty. You you've only you don't have to go very far. Now I know their kicker's a mess, and maybe that's part of it too. Their kicker missed two field goals, but I was stunned that just doing the math, they don't go. Let's just make them score two touchdowns and stop fooling around here. And as we've talked about, and we will talk about, they fooled around basically the whole second half offensively. It just I know they they threw it on the drive that they had to throw it on just to get them down the field. And credit to them, they got the field goal, yeah. but. And that was key. So many different other times where they threw it when they didn't need to. Just just milk the clock and get the hell out of there. And they're still in these, they're still throwing it on like second and short. Yes. They're doing all these random things. Well, and so that was like, I was already at like a nine. I, if they lost the game, I wasn't going to be like completely crestfallen because I do think this is a really good football team and weird things happen. But it would it would have been totally avoidable. But that one I thought was an easy one. Kick the field yeah. goal, make them score two touchdowns, and get the hell out yeah, of here. Yeah, and again, because somebody's saying, well, the, but if you kick the field goal, then they're going to start at the thirty. But they're going to start at the thirty, needing two touchdowns. Correct. That's a big difference to me. And you could say, well, but if it's an onside kick, they won't have to go and they recover it. They don't have to go that far. Still very different getting two touchdowns late than than than. Um, the the having to deal with the fact that they're twelve points or, or or that basically the game is is you're forcing them to score not score twice but score two touchdowns twice and even on the drive I was saluting that we played before the break we mentioned there were a couple of plays there late in that drive where you say run the ball a couple of times you know now you could argue that the screen that the short little screen pass to the tight end that's as good as a running play and maybe it is to a certain extent. But, um, I, I, you know, it's that cuteness thing. And then to, for me, for the coach to hide behind, I just, uh, we're, we're sending a message. Your message, I think, as a head coach, there's plenty of times to send the message of, I believe in you, Sam Darnold. I believe in you, JJ. I believe in this offense. And we're not going to be passive just handing the ball off three straight times and giving it right back to them. You could you can deliver that message and frankly have I think over and over again the message you're supposed to deliver at a time like that when they should have kicked the field goal is I, I got to do what I got to do to make sure we win the game because ultimately we're not going to be feeling very good about any of of our aggressiveness if all it has led to is a greater opportunity for the home team to steal a game that they have absolutely no business ending and, you know, um, are being in. And a couple of people have said, well, you're leaving out the Aaron Jones thing. That's reckless, too. Sorry. You mean trying to score? Get yes, a touchdown? Ridiculous. Yes. It, Ridiculous. If, if that was part of his motivation, that's not smart coaching. That's emotional coaching. The, the, the way I think you build a bond between a coach and players is – you let us play when it helps us win. And by doing that, you do nurture a relationship and a feeling of these got confidence in us. And then what you do is you make decisions that make sure we win. And the best chance to do that in that spot, 100%, was indeed to uh, to kick the field goal. And again, there's not going to be that much discussion about it because in the end... They held on and they won the ball game, but it was it was a bad move. Uh, top of the hour pause now. More talking points. Ben Lieber in the four o'clock hour. We'll see how Garzy if he's yet processed the big Carl Anthony Towns trade that the Wolves largely still couldn't talk about. I think a couple of players alluded to it. 
But I don't think the head coach could talk about it. I don't think Tim Conley could talk about it on media day today because it's not yet uh, quite official. And we'll mix in some uh, Bradshaw and Brian Cafe and text line items as well. Stay tuned.